Good evening and welcome to the Select Board Board of Health Sewer Commissioners meeting of June 12, 2024. This meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with a particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans to attend in person uh, versus virtual attendance. The meeting will be held in person in the main meeting room of Deerfield Municipal Offices. In accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, anyone attending to record the meeting must identify themselves to the clerk, Blake Gilmore, and provide their name and address for the record. All right, so I'll call the meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. Um, we're gonna start off with public comment. I know there are some people in the audience who'd like to come up and uh, make some comments, so come on up, whomever. Please identify yourself. You can sit at the table. I think these mics might work better. Sure, and uh, you sort of have to get, get really close to the mic, otherwise. In the background. Leah, All right. you're ruining it. No, I'm not. Her phone is literally down, upside down. Excuse Megan, me. Megan, I'm going to mute you. Oh. So, sorry for that, a little interruption. It's okay. Um, so, my name's David Johnson. I live at 112 North Main Street um, here in South Deerfield, and I'm concerned uh, about um, health hazard, biohazard, about um, a recently deceased horse that was buried immediately adjacent to my property line, and I'm concerned for a number of reasons, um, groundwater contamination risks, a disease spreading potential, and the legality of, of the entire situation. Um, in, in large part, I'm concerned uh, because we have a regular problem with groundwater there to begin with. Um, I live in a floodplain, so water is always an issue. Um, over and above that, um, I don't know what the cause of death of the horse was, so I don't know if it was illness or some other incident because I don't know if there was any veterinary assessment as to what happened there. So I can't be conclusive about you know, potential hazards. Um, and and in, addition, in addition to that, um, the Bloody Brook runs to the western side of my property. So there's always water coming down off the hillside, across the back fields, um, through the property immediately adjacent to my own, um, through the, the property of Miss Price that runs in the direction of Bloody Brook. The water table there is very high. If we dig down, 18 to 24 inches, you can watch the water run by. So we're, we're very concerned about that. In my own behalf, I'm, I'm concerned <coughs> about bacteria, I'm concerned about contamination. Um, I have fruit on my property. The, the um, historically noted grapes that the settlers stopped to eat. I, I have grape arbors on my property. I don't think it's safe to eat that this summer. I have a huge raspberry uh, uh, bushes in the corner. I don't think it's safe to eat that this summer um, because of something that was done in, in a fashion that I, I think lacked foresight in terms of implications and ramifications. I really believe that it poses um, a biohazard, a health hazard. Um, I think over and above that, because it's a residential area, I think it has potential impact for years to come in terms of the property itself because of the water table. We all have sump pumps in an area. Um, Ms. Price's property is to the eastern side. The water runs east to west. Um, what kind of assurance can I get that the water leaking into my basement won't be toxic at some point in time? I, again, a scientist I'm not, but I've, I've done a little bit of research and I've, I've tried to find articles that were um, not written particularly in legalese so that I could understand them. And I, I found one article in particular that I provided a copy to all of you um, that talks about um, 
the stages of decomposition, the, the first of which occurs in days to weeks, which is where we are now, um, bloat and active decay, uh, characterized by risks of emission of odors, toxic gases, attracting scavengers and pests. Then the next stage is advanced decay, leaching of fluids, soil contamination, and that happens in weeks to months, which means we're still on the very front end of this, not knowing what happens subsequently. Um, I'm concerned for a couple of reasons over and above that. Um, this burial site, again, is maybe six feet from my property and immediately adjacent to Ms. Price's house. Um, maybe, again, I would have to guess, but I have, I have pictures that I took. It's you know, maybe, maybe 12, maybe 15 feet at most. Um, it, it just seems to, pretend, to present with, with difficulties that are far reaching from property values to, to disease and illness to soil contamination. And as I said, even in, in terms of, of fruit and produce, I think it has lots of implications that uh, we need to address in some fashion. I also know that um, having done a little bit of research that there are no particular guidelines and that historically in agricultural areas where there's large pasture land, um, cows and horses can be buried in, in large open pastures. We're not talking about a large open pasture here. We're talking about a thick residential neighborhood. Um, it's a very different set of circumstances. I also know too that, that in terms of, of laws, there are no general commonwealth laws governing all this and that it's delegated to the respective communities. Um, until we had this incident, I suspect we haven't had any, any laws or any bylaws to address this, this kind of a situation, but now it's upon us and, and we really have to do something. I also know, having read the, the UMass Extension Corps, that their recommendations are, it, it's a terrible t thing now to exhume the uh, decaying body because it, it, it creates a, a potential greater biohazard. I'm not challenging that. I, what I am wondering is, is a lesser biohazard not a biohazard because it's not a greater biohazard? I mean, I think there's a biohazard no matter what's going on. So again, am I, I'm here out of concern. I'm not assuming an adversarial position. I'm, I'm not angry, but I'm very worried about this. I'm mm -hmm. worried for another reason in that four weeks ago, yesterday, I had major surgery as Rick rushed to the hospital in the middle of the evening. Um, and okay, I'm doing very well and I'm healing quite well, but I don't want to contract anything. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a legitimate yeah. concern, at least, yep. at least for me. Sure, absolutely. So in, in terms of, of Initial concerns, I, I guess that's what I'd like to present, and I, and I would encourage um, my neighbors to, uh, to share their points of view as well. I, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's important because it's, it, it's not an I, it, it's a we. We're mm -hmm. very concerned uh, about the implications, uh, the ramifications and consequences of this from house property values through including health and well-being of all the residents. Mm -hmm. So. So, thank so you. Um, just to, just one final question for you. I mean, it sounds as though you and your neighbors feel the horse should be removed from from where it's buried. Is that a consensus, or, or, or what is your what is your desired outcome? Well, I don't know because in the best of all possible worlds, I think that would make the most sense. Um, I'm also not sure that's possible based on what I read from UMass right. Extension Crops and their recommendations. I, again. This is not my wheelhouse, and I, and I have to acknowledge that. I also know that a friend of mine who's a contractor uh, uh, spoke to me today about coming in and digging a trench and filling it with clay and my property to prevent contamination. I shouldn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I shouldn't have to remediate, remediate a problem I didn't create. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the best solution is, but I know something has to happen because there's this big mound, and I have pictures that I can provide you with if you like. Um, you saw you came and yeah, saw I already the saw burial yep. site as well. Um, it's, okay. Something has to happen. I, okay. I don't know what that is, but I do know that um, the implications are far-reaching here. Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's a... 
I David. think it's a difficulty. It's a broad spectrum difficulty. Mm -hmm. In the interest of letting your neighbors speak, we have a 615 hearing that we have to start. So if, if one of your neighbors also wants to sure. speak, we've got two minutes ben, left. You want to say a couple things? Sorry about that. I didn't mean to cut you off. I know it's important. No, no. no problem with that one. It's a Council 110 North Main Street. Um, my neighbor and my property uh, is at the corner of Miss Price's property. Uh, and again, she, she didn't speak to any of us. And I share the same environmental concerns that, that Dave does. Um, I've got two small children, a two-year-old, a four-year-old. This is the area that they are playing. Um, I, my house is built in 1905. It's a fieldstone foundation. There's water that comes in. There's, there's continuously water moving from the field, which is, is a, you know, usually grows corn and is sold at the farm stand down the street. Right in the corner of that field, it floods right behind my house. Um, I have a bunch of pictures which I can share with you guys, but every time that it rains, the field floods right next to Ms. Price's property and then it comes across my property and Dave's property into the turnaround by the monument and on its way to Bloody Brook. So it's a constant issue. It's, it happens in the winter when, when there's rain, it happens during the thaw, and it happens all summer anytime there's some sort of moderate rain event. So this water is a consistent theme, and <coughs> there is contamination. It's going somewhere, and it's probably my house. It's probably Dave's house. Um, she buried the horse on the edge of her property, which is the least flow, right? The closest to Dave's property. So it's not going across hers, it's going directly onto ours. And I, I you know, it seems like an odd place to, to, to bury a horse. Um, I, I would like to, someone to look further into what are the actual health hazards here and what can be done about it. I know that we found we're early in the stage, so this is something that we should deal with immediately and, and, and not ruminate about and wait a couple of weeks and then say, oh, well, now it's past a certain point, right? We're still in the early stage of it, so we should be able to do something and come up with a solution before groundwater becomes an issue. All right, so um, one thing that I know we're gonna do is we're gonna share the information that uh, you provided with, us, with our town council tomorrow morning and um, find out what our options are as a town, I mean, We'll try to find a solution that meets everyone's concerns, um, what that solution will be. Uh, I still sound, sounds like you would like to see the horse removed, and, and that, that, if I were the neighbor, I would perhaps feel that way too. But let us consult with them and try to do something as quickly as possible if we're going to do something. And, and go ahead. Yeah, and just so that you know, we've been reaching out to different agencies, state agencies, to help us with this, and this is a unique situation. There's no question. So I don't really, I can't, there's no definitive answer at this right. point. And like I said, we're, we're trying to reach out to see if we've got um, somebody that can guide us through this to try to, get, try to figure out how to get an end result for you. Great. And, and, and to the future, I think, you know, if there is any result from this too, we should probably come up with some sort of regulations of how this is dealt with in, in the town and... Um, I know when I looked into the zoning, it, it's Central Village, and I don't know how that pertains to bearing agricultural livestock, um, mm -hmm. but it's something that we should look into. All right. I agree All with right. you. Thank you. Thank for, you. Thanks. All right. So we'll, sorry that if anyone else was looking to comment, that we have to start the, the hearing that's scheduled for 615. Uh, notice pub a public hearing town of Deerfield in accordance with the MGL chapter 140 section 157 and town of Deerfield bylaws chapter 60 section 10. The Deerfield select board will hold a public hearing on, uh, this is, which one am I reading? Uh, do I, this one has February 7, but this is a continuation. That's right? the continuation okay. of that hearing. Does for it, reference, that's what it's there for. Does it go into continuation later or I just read this? Um, I don't, I think you could simply say that you're continuing. Maybe so this is a, reference yeah, th notice. this is a continuation of a public hearing that began on February 7th and has okay. had one or two other meetings. So at this point, um, are all the parties here? 
I see uh, Joel Thomas. Uh, I can't see the last one. Adam Adams, yes. And uh, Jeremy Cohen, who represents um, the, uh, the dog owner. So um, where are we? Good evening. Uh, again, Jeremy Cohen for Kate Clayton Jones. Uh, when we last met, you may recall, it was for Ms. Clayton Jones to, to take additional affirmative steps to, to try to reduce the barking or the, the noise coming from our property. And so I submitted some um, photos from a, a while back that my client, she, she wrapped her fences with um, privacy uh, material so that, because we had discussed at the hearing that maybe if the, the dogs can't see out, they can't be triggered by a, a moving a person or another dog walking by since it's a busy uh, area. And so she put those, she implemented that probably two months ago. I sent everything about a month ago. Um, I'm not, so she's done something uh, towards this to ameliorate the situation. I'm not sure how it's, I haven't heard any feedback yet, if it's been effective or not. Yeah, we, we are in receipt of those photographs. Um, Mr. Thomas Adams, have you um, something to add? Also, while we're waiting for... All right, does that work? Yes, now we can hear okay. you. Okay, um, pardon me, I was muted. I would not use the word ameliorate um, at all. In fact, in this spring and early summer, because our windows have been open and we like to have them open for the fresh air, we have had the intrusive effect of the dog's constant barking much more palpable in our house. In every part of our house, day and night, um, sometimes for hours at a time. It's very extreme and I am deeply frustrated that it has, been take, it has taken this long for something to be done about what is a very egregious breach of these bylaws. Recently, even though I knew it wouldn't do any good, um, I did call the police at midnight because the dog had been barking for hours. Um, uh, I'd, like I'd like to keep talking if I can. Yeah, we're, we're trying to get somebody to mute the person. I just unmuted iPad 2. Apologies for the interruption. All right, I, oh, so when I called the police, the police told me and I thought this was really quite extraordinary. Um, the police told me that they would not send an officer to the house despite the barking, and they recognized that the barking was going on, but they would not send an officer to the house because the dog had bitten an officer before, and so they couldn't send an officer to um, enforce the law, which was really quite an extraordinary thing. I was trying to think of an analogy for that, and I couldn't think of one. But whatever the privacy wrapping is, and I did notice that that had gone up on the fences, it has done absolutely nothing to abate or ameliorate the situation at all. It is very, very loud at our house. My wife was awakened at three o'clock in the morning one day this week with a very bad migraine, and I found her curled up in misery on the couch um, with this dog just pounding and pounding and pounding auditorily away in our home. Uh, so it, it is an extreme situation. It has not changed at all. If anything, it's worse because of the season. Mm. Okay, um, we also have um an attorney from our law firm who's in attendance, um, Mr. Proger, um, what are our options in this hearing? It sounds like the, the steps that Ms. Clayton Jones took haven't seemed to address the problem. Um, what are we empowered to do? Uh, I mean, I know that we can label the dog a nuisance dog, but what are we able to do that will help Mr. Thomas Adams? Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Matt Proventure, represent the town of Deerfield. Um, so under a nuisance complaint, you have a pretty broad set of powers. You've got a, the board has to vote to make a finding that the specific dog in question is a nuisance due to excessive barking. But after that, the board has pretty broad power to try to fashion an appropriate remedy. Uh, but ultimately, I would say that the board's choices should be guided by the fact that whatever it seeks to do, it should be to eliminate the cause of any nuisance that it finds. 
So where I think in this circumstance where the complaint is principally about barking and excessive noise um, and not the dog behaving in any other way that's a nuisance, I would suggest that the board should explore options for compliance that would prevent, reduce, or ameliorate that. I would caution the board, though, that it does not have the power to order that the animal be removed from the town of Deerfield. Um, outside of that constraint, though, the board has pretty broad latitude to fashion an appropriate remedy. Um, and I think, as in all cases, the, the simplest way is to engage in a dialogue to see if Mr. Thomas Adams is seeking any particular relief from the board or is leaving it up to the board's discretion. Um, and then also just, I, I usually also inquire just to make sure whether there is any obstacle with anybody who would be burdened, like Ms. Clayton Jones, by an order entered by the board to make sure that there's no specific difficulty or unusual circumstance or hardship that would prevent it from being effective, even if there were a desire to comply. That, that's generally my guidance. So. If you have any specific questions, I'm happy to do it, but generally this is a matter for the board's sound discretion and judgment to try to come up with an effective remedy that works for everyone involved. So we're under a bit of a, a conundrum tonight in that uh, the only other board member who's been a party to these hearings is um, not able to attend this evening. So I'm on my own and uh, Mr. Gilmore is a new member of the select board and this is his first introduction to this issue. Um, so it sounds as though the remedies we've tried to pursue haven't worked. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, so the only other thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, in my engineering days, there are noise cancellation sorts of products that create white noise. I mean, I don't even know if that's a reasonable thing to consider, but it doesn't sound like short of the dog being confined inside that it's not going to be able to be heard at all hours and and I'm assuming that everybody's acted in good faith here but the problem hasn't resolved itself so does Mr. Cohen do you have any ideas about what Ms. Clayton Jones would like to try next uh well, in previous hearings, I've suggested it could be mutual in terms of um, white noise machines, et cetera. And I also suggested, and again, I don't know the way of the land, it sounds like there's a valley in the sense of the noise comes up, where, um, but it was rejected by the complainant that she could per participate in putting it up, as you talk about, a, a sound barrier. It would have to be closer to his his property, I would assume, to, to deflect the noise, but this is this is a problem that can be fixed, but it, it takes some cooperation, and um, it, because it, I think the next step would have to be an investment in some type of a this barrier, whether it's uh, made out, of, whether it's trees or some type of soundproof barrier for um, yeah, out of material that they have. It's it's doable, I'm not sure of the cost, but when I previously brought it up, Mr. Thomas Adams, who I remember, didn't want it anywhere near his property, um, if I remember correctly, or it might have been the expense, but um, if he's still being bothered by it, we, and it's all hours of the night, I think we, we need to um, think about something else. So, uh, with, every, with, with every respect, I, I find it absolutely preposterous and, and frankly personally insulting that somebody would suggest that the victim needs to be part of the solution. I'm not breaking any laws. Um, there is a clear violation of the Deerfield bylaw about disturbing the peace here. So the, the burden of this is on the person who is producing this noise. And you know there, there are certainly steps uh, one of the steps would be not to let the dogs out at midnight and 3 o'clock in the morning unless somebody's with them and has them on a leash so that they're not barking incessantly. That would at least be a step toward mitigating the intrusion of this. Um, it seems pretty reasonable to ask someone not to have their dog outside barking for two hours at a time at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so I, I, I haven't seen any actual genuine steps to do something about this. Well, one, one thing I would point out um, is Mr. Thomas Adams is never going to be satisfied, but I've asked now, this is hearing number four, 
uh, well, fourth that I've been to, not fourth the complainant. And take a video. Can you take a timestamp video at three in the morning? So I, I have no reason to doubt you, but none of us have heard this or seen it. You do. So can we get something to be like, oh my God, that is, I, I, I want to take your word for it, but at the same time, You've dismissed anything Ms. Clayton Jones has done as being ineffective. She's not doing this purposely. If you, are, if this is bothering you the way it is, it would bother me too. I want, I, you shouldn't have to live this way. I agree, but can we get a little bit of, of proof that this happens day and night, every day and night, and, and at these odd hours? The proof is easily obtainable. All you have to do is just stop on 5 and 10 in front of her house and listen for a little bit. That's not a problem. Also, every police department has decibel meters. Um, if, if you want to come up to this house, if the police want to come up to this house with a decibel meter and listen, um, they can do that. Again, you're, putting, you're, 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 you're questioning my credibility um, to throw doubt on a case where the evidence is utterly explicit. And you and say that, me, but you won't honestly, produce it. You say it's utterly explicit. It's not my job to do that. As the it's complainant, her job to stop making noise. Well, uh, as a complainant, you you're not a victim. You're a complainant about a nuisance, and you refuse now for seven months to submit any evidence besides your word. Yeah, I'm not going to accept your word for it. Uh, so, without the evidence, I can't really move my client further to take more uh, expensive measures. You just think everybody else should do it for you, and we're not going to do it that way. There's That's other steps you can take. Line of so argument. Yeah. You can take uh, steps too to ameliorate the situation. You should be putting up using sound machines. You should be finding alternative ways to, to dampen the noise as well. So, Imagine if so, the police were called to so, my neighbor's house for very loud rock and roll music at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then somebody representing my, the complainant said, well, you should just put on noise-canceling headphones. Uh, I mean, that's a preposterous line of reasoning. So, and and you, you've, you've artfully insinuated that somehow my, my word is not credible. And yet, why would anyone waste their time in a well, process? Well, I've seen you working on so, I've seen you know, all the letters you've written and articles you've written through the years complaining about things. So I know you're a particular person who would put the time in. I want to help you. We can resolve this. I've reached out to you. I've emailed you. Let's communicate. You've never emailed. You've never emailed. You've never emailed. So let's. Never uh, a par pardon me. Pardon me. Can I interrupt no, here? We're we're you. arguing at no purpose at this point, um, Mr. Provencher, um I don't know that. Um, short of short of declaring the dog a nuisance and having no resolution to Mr. S Mr. Uh, Thomas Adams' problem. Um, the only other thing I can suggest is I don't, I don't want to make this decision on my own because, you know, there are, even if I declared the dog a nuisance, um, Mr. Gilmore probably couldn't vote to, to make that. So the only other thing I see is to continue this hearing one more time to our next meeting, which is the 26th, when the only other select board member who's been involved in this process can, can be here to vote on this. And um, we will make some recommendations and they won't be, you know, they shouldn't, I, I, I agree that the person who is complaining about an issue probably shouldn't be the one that bears the financial burden to solve it. But, um, you know, I wanna do something that's reasonable as well. So does this, I know this is one more hearing, um, but what's your advice? So my advice to the board is first, I think your instinct is correct. I think the, you know, the, the absence of Mr. McDaniel poses a practical issue. I know that uh, Mr. Gilmore is a new board member. Uh, I know that you're very familiar with this, but I think you would want to have Mr. McDaniel present to vote with a quorum of two because you've both been present at all of the other hearings on this question. Um, two, I think that if you want to enter an order, the order is directed at the owner of the dog found to be a nuisance. Um, I, I don't know that you really have jurisdiction to order anyone else to do anything if you make a finding of a right. nuisance. I think that crafting an appropriate remedy could include stating that the dog is not allowed to be outdoors at certain hours. If it's outdoors, it has to be supervised by an individual. Um, you could order that the dog be confined for certain periods. 
I, I think you have some pretty broad latitude and there's some room to be creative. And the other benefit of potentially allowing Mr. McDaniel to weigh in is that you may have more capability in discussing the matter to come up with something creative and something workable. Uh, separately, I also just wanted to make a point of order. There, there were some references by Mr. Thomas Adams to you determining whether this is a violation of a separate bylaw enacted by the town of Deerfield. The purpose of this hearing is solely to adjudicate whether the dog is a nuisance under Chapter 140, Section 157 of the General Laws. Um, you are not making a binding determination as to whether any of the actions violate any other statute or any other prohibition that's imposed, whether by the town of Deerfield or the general laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, I say that just to point out that Mr. Thomas Adams and Ms. Clayton Jones, for that matter, retain the rights that they otherwise possess under the law, which includes the right to bring a private action seeking to enjoin a nuisance or to seek damages for any nuisance or trespass. Um, that's entirely up to them. I just want to make clear for the board that it's deciding a very narrow issue, which is whether the dog is a nuisance under the laws of the Commonwealth. So um, I think that what I'm going to do is follow your advice and um, continue the hearing to um, 6.30 on June 26th. Um, so that Mr. McDaniel can be present, uh, at which time we will make a determination on the underlying question of whether the dog's a nuisance or not, and um, make some recommendations about um, how this should be uh, addressed. Um, so I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank you for your participation tonight, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If there's nothing further, no, uh, I'm happy you. to stay if you'd like, if you need any further assistance. No, thank you so much. We appreciate your attendance. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you for having me. Okay. Um, all right. The next order of business is um, continuation of a hearing on application for new wines and malt beverages license for Primo Pizzeria and Restaurant Inc. at 4B Sugarloaf Street. Is there anyone representing this it, party in attendance? Mr. Chair, it's supposed to start at 645. Oh, it's so. 645? I, I thought it was 630. I'm sorry. No. All right, so let's deal with some minutes then. You have two sets, one from May 15th and one from <clears throat> May 29th. Have you had a chance to read them? Um, like, I just I'd like to, to note for the board that the May 15th, the May 29th minutes, there's a revision in there. I found a few um, typographical errors and just some formatting that needed to be adjusted. Okay. Um, I'll give you a couple minutes to, to look through those, Blake. Okay. And I'll look at the revised one. <coughs> Okay. All right. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to approve the uh, May 15, 2024 minutes as written. Second. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Uh, uh, Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. And I'd like to make the motion to approve the May 29, 2024 minutes as written, as revised. Second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Um, as we still have a few more minutes, um, we had to curtail the 
public comment period, and I know that uh, Chris Harris has one short comment he'd like to make, so. So, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to reflect on this past Saturday where there was the time capsule burial, and, um, and, and thank you much, and thereafter at Town Hall. Um, on behalf of the Friends of Deerfield and the 350th Steering Committee, um, we just want to thank everyone that attended. We did have a kind of a full house of what we expected, over 70 persons uh, for the luncheon. And um, uh, it was great with the participation of the select board. Um, and Carolyn Schwarzenegger did a great job of kind of being MC. And uh, we appreciated the turnout, the support, uh, and all the hard work that went into it, obviously, by the Friends of Deerfield board members and the Marie Thomases of the world, and Peter Thomases of the world. And uh, so that's all I wanted to say is thank the community for turning out. Um, and it was a great wrap up to a great uh, 350th anniversary year. Yeah, and I just also want to recognize Holly Linkowski, who's in the audience tonight. She was instrumental in a lot of the 350th work as well. So thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, we still have a little more time to go through. I will make a couple. Of, I attended a meeting with FERCOG and several of other, um, other regional planning commissions this afternoon about um, a federal plan. They're looking to expand uh, a, a, an electrical corridor between the New York State and the Northfield um, hydro installation. It's a 60-mile corridor where they're looking to um, have a half mile on either side of, the, of this corridor to um, study and possibly install, you know, m more and uh, more forward-looking electrical systems. We're at the early stages of trying to understand what this ultimately would give a lot of power to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to make decisions about this land and what can go there. So um, we're going to be following and participating in uh, a four-phase process to study what the implications are for Deerfield and the surrounding communities. Um, it's too early to say what, if anything, will be plus or minus for us. Um, do you have any uh, things that you've been working on, Blake? No, um, not right now. Okay. Um, and we obviously um, know we're going to do some more research on the uh, health agent front for, for this horse question. So. Right. Any other things that we can take up, Casey? You could take up the sewer commitment. Okay. Um, and I did write a motion for it. Um, how far? It's in probably about three or four pages of maybe. Hold on. I, mean, I put page numbers on this thing so I could figure it out myself. <laughs> Too much paper. Too much paper. Um, it's on page eight. Is it the, um, okay. Sewer commitment. Can you, can you just give us a little preface before I make this motion? So this is the second sewer commitment for fiscal year 2024. We received the water readings um, very recently and the treasurer spent a great deal of time getting everything in here so we can get these bills out. Um, <coughs> we are behind in the billing, so this is, she asked us to put a placeholder on so that we can make sure we had this signed as soon as possible. So my recommendation is to, for the board to vote and sign the commitment. So this was after all the, all the, uh, the water bills came in yes. and the water usage yes. came in? We and received the water readings, I wanna say it was the beginning of the last week or the week, uh, the Friday before. I don't have a calendar in front of me, but. Yep. Um, yeah, we received them recently. And I know Sarah she was worked working, really hard to get working them done. over the weekend to try and get this done because she's got an important event coming up soon. So, um, so you want to, do, do you know enough about this? You want to do the? Yep. Yep. Uh, I move to approve the fiscal year 2024 sewer billing commitment number two in the amount of 873931 and 24 cents. Second. Any uh, further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. All right, anything else? 
Um, oh, we're two minutes left. Two minutes. Um, actually, you have an appointments list. Actually, we have Christopher's not here yet. Um, this is for so the police and skims. We don't have scams. We do have the police department appointments. Okay. I, in a memo from Chief Pachurik dated June 3rd. And how it, it is pretty significant. <coughs> um, it's two pages long. Let's let's hold off then. Yeah. Because I didn't. My my thought was maybe the board would choose not to read the entire thing. Yeah. Because it is in the packet um, and available for review, but it's up to you. No, I'll, I'll just wait until. Uh, um, the participants for the. I asked Chief Sparks to make an adjustment to his roster so that it could show more information. Um, so I expect to see that in the next day or so. So we'll put that on for the 26th. And I'm just going to. All right. <clears throat> Do we know if Primo's folks are? I don't. They knew what time. They knew the date and time. Um, there he is. Oscar just got on. Okay. Good. Yeah, I thought I wasn't sure that was the applicant. Okay, so <clears throat> it's now 6.45, um, so I'm going to um, move to reopen um, the continuation of a Select Board Board of Health um, public hearing on application for a new wines and malt beverages license at 4B Sugarloaf Street, South Deerfield, MA, uh, from Primo Pizzeria and Restaurant, Inc. Um, and uh, Mr. Rodas is in attendance. Um, can you tell us, Casey, what uh, what oh, sure. legal information we've received oh, since? So, and shop around for quotes, little things. Valerie, I'm going to mute you. I tweak some of my coverages. So, hi, Oscar. Um, <coughs> Mr. Chair, we, as you know, there was a license that was approved at an earlier date this year in April for a wine and malt beverage license for another restaurant in town. That license is still under review by the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission. Um, I contacted town council and discussed it with town council. And then I contacted Ralph Sacramone, who's the executive director at ABCC. And because the license, that previous approval is still under review, technically the board does not have a license, a beer and wine license to award. So Director Sacramone suggested two things, that the board, because the board does not have a license there's one in review right now, so technically it's not available. It's, it, was his, it was his thought that perhaps the board retain the information in the application that was submitted by, by Mr. Rodas and that if a license becomes available, we notify them. Um, the other alternative is for Primos to apply for an all-alcoholic beverage liquor license from the town. Um, so to that end, I did further discuss it in terms of what, what the board could be expected to vote with Director Sacramone, and he gave me some suggested language which I've provided in a motion. Um, I don't know if Mr. Rodas has questions for me or for the board. I'm happy to try to answer them, but I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Can you unmute, Mr. Rodas? Can uh, can you unmute, uh, there we Mr. Rodas? Go. Oh, good. Thank you. We still can't hear. Still can't I'm hear. I'm sorry. You. We still can't. We hear still can't you. hear you. Um, are are you? Can 
Chris Nolan, can you try to mute and unmute him to see if that helps? Yeah, I'll give it a try. Okay, unmute. Okay, can you try to speak again, Mr. Otis? I'm uh, still unable to hear yeah, you, so hear you. Um, I'm sorry uh, about the technical difficulty. Um, do you, um, did you understand what uh, Casey Warren, the town administrator, said? You can nod. Uh, so um, the options we have is to continue the hearing, or if you're within five minutes, you could come down to town hall. We could wait for you to arrive here, and then we could have a conversation. Or we can proceed with what she recommended, which was to deny this application until we get clearance on whether the, uh, the whether there will be a new opening for beer and wine, or you know, you could pursue another path. So what would you prefer to do? Would you like to come down here if you're close enough, or do you want to, we could continue the hearing until May 26, I mean June 26, um, if you want to be present, um, or if you can signal by shaking your head yes or no. <laughs> So do you want us to continue this until June 26? No, okay. So what we'll do is follow um, the advice of the ABCC and with the understanding that we will, um, if, if the, the, the license that's pending doesn't get approved, that we will notify you. Is that acceptable? Okay. All right, so you wanna make this motion? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to move to deny Primo's Pizzeria application for an on-premise pouring license for wine and malt beverages as there are no available licenses at this time. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank you and sorry about the technical so difficulties. Sorry. So we'll keep you informed if something opens up or if you want to come and do the all liquor license will certainly entertain that application as well. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> I don't know if, Chris, there's Christopher. Okay. So he's on for 7.15. Um, maybe what? I'll text him and see if he wants to hop on sooner. If he can't, um, maybe Chris Nolan would be willing to give you his updates on the Leary lot. Yeah. Chris, are you prepared to do that? Sure. Yeah, just let me know. I can do that whenever. Casey, I'm also available. I'm just talking okay. on my computer right now. All right. Um, Chris, Christopher, do you want to go? And yeah. I've got your motions ready. <laughs> Fixed. Sure, I'll start the... <laughs> I'm still hopping on here, but um, yeah. Uh, so top of the list, I would say, is the contract with Ty and Bond for their complete street services on Elm Street. Uh, so just as a refresher, uh, this is a contract that we're entering into with Ty and Bond uh, for surveying work on Elm Street, uh, as well as a conceptual design for sidewalk and crosswalk, um, and general pedestrian complete streets improvements uh, between Railroad Street and uh, Main Street there. Um, the total is 27500 and uh, let me know if there are any questions from the board regarding that, that contract. Can you, um, can you talk to us about the source of the money for the Complete Streets? That's a grant that we have. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of lay it out the funding sources here. Uh, so for this particular $27,500, we have a $40,000 appropriation from town meeting specifically for complete streets. I believe that was back at a 2019 town meeting. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, uh, I'm actually in the process of working with Ty and Bond on an application for the municipal ADA improvement grant. Uh, that application is due Friday. 
Um, and essentially that would pick, you know, up to $200,000, uh, you know, specifically for the sidewalk surfaces. And, uh, you know, ultimately what we'll be doing with Time Bond is working towards a full complete streets application. Um, and that would involve, you know, upwards of $500,000 potentially uh, for, you know, all of the improvements we'd like to see on that stretch of Elm Street. So, you know, changes to parking, uh, installation of a tree lawn or any other improvements that we ultimately uh, decide make sense for the town. Blake, do you have questions? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll make this motion then. Uh, move to approve contract with Tie and Bond Inc. for the Complete Streets Tier 3 Services Elm Street Survey and conceptual plans as presented and to authorize the chair to sign. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Okay. Um, while I'm signing, you want to go on to the next thing? He got more. He's got more. Yeah, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Uh, sorry, it's, it's saying I'm the assistant town administrator, but I am not. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I guess next on the, uh, the agenda here would be um, the contract with Bureau Happold. Uh, again, members of the board will probably recall that uh, we got a grant for this project. It's uh, $50,000 from HEAT, which is a, a Massachusetts nonprofit. Uh, it's what's called a Kickstart Mass Grant. Uh, and this is specifically to look at feasibility for a network geothermal uh, system in South Deerfield. Um, so as a reminder, this was three iterations, uh, you know, network geothermal around the existing town campus and some businesses downtown, then going out a little further, looking at connecting with the schools, and then beyond that, looking at connecting with public and, and or treehouse. Um, so it's just a feasibility study. Uh, you know, Bureau Happold would basically be conducting some interviews with key stakeholders, Berkshire Gas, folks at Pelican, Berkshire Brewing, um, and I've also invited some members of the Energy Committee to, to participate in that as well. Um, and then they would also be looking at basically energy loads for the buildings around, around town, as well as the existing gas infrastructure um, to see if this you know, is, a, it is feasible. Um, so again, it's $50,000 through the heat grant and uh, the pro project would conclude by uh, the end of the calendar year. So you are under constraint to get this done? Correct, and it's uh, it's taken a bit longer than we hoped to get under contract. Um, Bureau Happold had some initial issues with the architects and engineers contract that we sent them. Um, so we had a little bit of back and forth, but I think we're, we're pretty close at this point. Uh, I believe the version in front of you has, um, you know, one change that Bureau Happold hadn't quite gotten around to responding about, um, but it's very minor at this point. I think we're pretty much ready to proceed. So do we need to make a conditional motion or is the motion you wrote okay? Yeah, the motion, I actually took the motion from, uh, I initially wrote one and then I revised it to meet his uh, suggested motion language. So it should be all set. So move to approve the contract with Bureau Happold Consulting Engineers PC for the networked geothermal feasibility study as presented and authorized the chair to sign second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. <clears throat> you have one more, uh, Christopher? Got two. Yeah, a couple more here. Um, so um, next one on there would be the letter of support uh, for uh, the Elm Street uh, application that I referred to earlier for uh, municipal ADA improvements. Um, so again, this, this is just kind of part and parcel of that uh, complete streets program we talked about on Elm Street between Railroad and Main Street. Um, you know, this, uh, the grant application for this particular program is due on Friday. Um, beyond the select board, I've also reached out to Jen Remillard at the Senior Center to make sure that we get a letter from them as well. So she's, she's going to provide that too. And I think it should give us a pretty strong application for this funding.
So we are on the. Do you have any other questions for, from for him? No. Like, okay. So you're ready to go on this? The letter support. Yeah, you're gonna have to sign this one too, or I can do it. Uh, move to approve a letter of support for the application to the Mass Office of Disability Municipal ADA Improvements Grant Program to fund Elm Street pedestrian improvements as presented. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Aye. Yeah, and the, the last item I'll be speaking to is uh, a letter of support for a variance that Hamshaw Lumber is applying for. Um, and, you know, this has to do with the building they're looking to construct on Elm Street uh, next to the Leary Lot project. Um, there's, the letter has some additional details uh, that the board could review, um, but the, the long and short of it is the building they're looking to construct does not quite meet our setback requirements in that district. Uh, Hamshaw is hoping to be able to have, get a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, and, you know, given the town's support for the project overall, we thought it would be appropriate to go ahead and ask the select board to support that uh, application for a variance. So, happy to pull up the, uh, you know, any further details about it if the, the board would like to know a little bit more, but uh, this is for a June 27 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting that will be coming up. Um, I, if you can share, um, just show us why this was necessary and um, for the audience as well. Sure. Can everyone see my screen okay up here? Yes. Okay. Uh, I can anyway. So that, great. So that I'll, I'll try to walk people through this a little bit. Uh, so over on this side is Railroad Street. Um, this, this building with the kind of dashed lines around it is, or the, you know, the uh, angled lines around it is Hamshaw's existing building at 16 Elm. And then uh, this is you know, the parcels that show, um, you know, the land swap between the town and Hamshaw lumber. Um, so with that orientation, I'll, let me zoom out here a little. It's kind of shifts things a little bit. So Elm Street is on this side and Railroad is on this side. Here's their existing building and then here's the proposed building which is a little over 12,000 square feet. Um, I'll zoom in here. Um, this is basically the Leary Lot driveway or the proposed driveway and it enters onto Elm Street at this point. Um, between uh, the Property line, oh, this is, this is showing the old property line. Um, but also here's the property line, this dash line here. And you've got less than 10 feet essentially between the property line and the, the edge of the building. Um, in that district, we require, we require a 10 foot setback. Um, so uh, Hampshaw is hoping to be able to, you know, get a variance. Um, they do already have a special permit from uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and so this is kind of just trying to confirm, you know, hey, is it all right if we also move forward with this, uh, you know, given that we don't quite have the setback, but it, it doesn't seem to be posing any major issues that would warrant um, revoking that special permit or anything like that. So, Christopher, you, you explained to me in the conversation about this that because um, Oftentimes the concern in setbacks is fire safety because existing structures that are too close together can become involved. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the five, I think it's five feet at the corner there and then the 25 foot width of the sidewalk and driveway and why that um, seems like a reasonable um, way to address that concern? Yeah, so setbacks obviously are pretty common to a lot of town zoning bylaws. Um, it's not always spelled out exactly why the setbacks exist, um, but often fire safety is a major, or any kind of emergency access for that matter, is a consideration. Um, in this case, you know, I don't think it's a major concern because there's a, a driveway, you know, right there. It's not uh, as if it's set back from a property line that then has a building. Um, so there's adequate fire access, whether or not they have a 10-foot setback. 
Um, additionally, you know, you have setbacks for reasons of not obscuring light or airflow for other neighbors. Again, not really a concern here because the neighbor is the town and it's a driveway. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, it's pretty reasonable to be asking for a variance given that all the reasons you would have the setback aren't really present here. And a lot of this is described in this letter of support, so I just, I wanted to tease out some of the thought process behind it before, you know, um, and to give Blake a chance to read through it if he hadn't uh, seen it earlier. I had, I had the opportunity to read this before the meeting, but. Um, so this is directed at the, the chair of the ZBA. Yeah, I actually. I actually was at the ZBA when they approved this, so I actually know what it's talking about. Okay, good. So um, if there aren't any other questions, do you want to make a motion? Sure. Move to approve the letter of support for the application of a variance under Mass General Law Chapter 40, Section 10, submitted by Hampshire Deerfield LLC as presented. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchi, aye. All right. All right. Hardy appetite. Did you have it? Could Joe's iPhone please mute themselves? Thank you. Does the, does the board have any further questions? Blake? Nope. I'm good. Uh, I'm okay, Casey. You don't have anything for him, do you? Okay. I tried Thank to get together everything you needed. <laughs> thanks for all the coordination on that. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Christopher. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Christopher. All right. So we've done the sewer commitment. Yep. Um, you did the minutes. Yep. We did Chris, this. Look. Chris could do the Larry Lot updates unless you want to go through. No, let's go ahead and do the uh, Larry Lot, um, which is a lot of news tonight so go ahead Christopher Nolan sure thank you all very much um, so to give an update on the Leary lot I think I've sent the board a lot of emails but so that everyone else knows uh, we have been in the process of working with MassDoc to handle some of the last bits of paperwork that are needed before we can have a signed grant agreement that we've been trying to get the most with the Federal Highway Administration essentially uh, there were two uh, pieces that needed to be approved uh, in order to get this Federal Highway Administration grant executed. One of them is the right-of-way issue. So we were operating under the assumption for a while that because we had no plans to uh, have any work take place on property other than the Leary lot, that there were going to be no right-of-way issues. That's what we had been led to believe. Um, and it turned out that because there was a proposal to uh, saw cut along the property line on the western edge of the lot next to Hampshaw, um, that MassDOT would not certify that we would not need any easements or anything of that nature uh, because people's feet, machinery, uh, anything like that might need to cross over the property line in the process of constructing a lot if they're saw cutting along the property line. Um, I tried to find a way around that by asking if we could just push the saw cut over by a foot, but we're already we're already up against our 25 foot uh, width of the exit. So we moved on, um, had a lot of help from Christopher as well as from our consultants at Rivermore uh, and from Jeff Squire at Berkshire Design Group. It's, it's really been a great team effort. Um, and what we have gotten is a right of entry agreement, which was the course of action that was recommended by MassDOT. Um, so the board approved that. Thank you very much again at your meeting on Monday. Um, we have since had it signed by Hamshaw, meaning it is fully executed. Uh, and we are awaiting language from MassDOT that the town will need in order to, it, it's a slightly convoluted process because what happens next is the town needs language from MassDOT to be able to self-certify that the right-of-way issue is taken care of. So that's one of the last steps. The other last step that I mentioned in my ATA report as well is the uh, State Historic Preservation Officer. So aside from the right-of-way issue, the other major 
uh, piece of approvals that were needed for getting this grant agreement out the door uh, was under NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act. Uh, so under NEPA, uh, the piece that has taken the longest is approval from the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, that is underneath the Secretary of State's office, or the Secretary of the Commonwealth, rather. Um, and that was sent to them on May 20th for review. Now, we know that there aren't any historic properties that are impacted by this, by this project. Um, we, we have access to the database that they will use to make that determination and have already confirmed several times that it won't be an issue. But nevertheless, they have a 30-day review period, and at this point, they will be at that 30 days by next week. So they have been eager to, to kind of use that full review period that they're allotted. Um, but on the bright side, at the very latest by next week, we should have that determination back from them. And as soon as that happens, and as soon as we have the right of way issue certified, which we will have the language to do after we get a response from MassDOT, uh, we will be prepared to have this fully executed by Federal Highway. We've been assured of that by our agreement officer over at Federal Highway Administration. Uh, so that's that. There's, there's obviously been a lot of moving pieces just to kind of navigate through the bureaucracy that's needed to, to get this federal grant going. Um, I, I know it's, it's been several months in the making, and I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, and I, I think we're going to start seeing the fruits of our, our labor very soon. Uh, because another exciting update that I have on the Leary Lot is that we opened bids today. Um, and they, they came in a little higher than we had budgeted for, but still well within our contingency. Um, we, we intentionally had a, had a very large cushion because we knew there was a chance of certain cost overruns. Um, so the, the low bid uh, was a firm that's already uh, been working with the town, and Christopher can definitely talk about that. I think he took off for the evening, but if you want to touch base with him privately, I'm sure he can give an update on some of the complete streets work that's been happening with Taylor Davis, and they submitted the low bid. So we're going to be moving forward, contingent upon a couple of reference checks um, with Taylor Davis Landscape and Construction out of Amherst, um, and that's exciting news as well because that was another major step that needed to happen before we can see boots on the ground at the Cleary Lot. So I think that is the extent of my update for this week. Does anybody have any questions at all? Um, I had a question for both you and Casey, um, and, and that's just a matter of, so um, are we going to have a motion on, a, on approving, or, or will we do that after we get the clearances from? I think we have to wait, don't we, Chris? You guys need to meet with Taylor Davis. We don't have a notice to award, right? We do not. Um, okay. and then yeah, we, we still have to, to meet with Taylor Davis. We're doing a scoping review meeting on Friday to, to double check that everything is good um, with their bid, that everything is covered that needs to be. Um, and then by the next meeting of the board, which I unfortunately won't be at, um, but we, we plan to have hopefully a contract in place to award. And that's also contingent on us having a Federal Highway Administration grant uh, agreement signed because we can't be awarding right. construction contracts until that's done but I'm I'm hell-bent for lack of a better term on getting that taken care of before I leave so excellent so that's uh, you mentioned that the 30 days runs out some mid midweek next week correct uh, 30 days is actually the 19th okay good well thanks for all the hard work absolutely yeah I'm really eager to see it finally pay off I know Sometimes it feels like we're doing all of this and there isn't much of a reward, but it, it, it's, it's on its way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's, Absolutely. feels like Groundhog Day sometimes. Yes. <laughs> the movie, not the actual day. Yeah, um, I know what you mean. All right. Um, so the next thing... The next thing... Is... Um, is Chris's position. Yeah, so first, I guess we... Um, we have the sad news for us, but happy news for Chris that he's moving on to a new job um, and that we uh, have received a letter of uh, resignation that uh, your last day will be June 21st. And um, so I reluctantly move to accept the resignation letter submitted by Assistant Town Administrator Chris Nolan with deep regret and sincere thanks for his hard work and dedication to the town of Deerfield. 
Second. All those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. And so, Mr. Chair, may I say something? Please, by all means. <laughs> I'm going to... This is really hard because Chris has just been amazing, um, especially with all of his work on the, the Leary lot, but so many other things that he's contributed um, to helping move things along here since he started. I know if Trevor was here, he would say it's gonna be so difficult for him to be gone. So I just wanted to make sure I say it because I feel that way, but also because I know Trevor would say it if he were here, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate everyone's everyone's wishes. Um, yeah, I've really I've really appreciated my my time serving the community here in Deerfield. Uh, I've taken a lot of lessons with me, and I'll only be the Connecticut River away, just right on the other side of it. So, um, yeah, always feel free to reach out. <laughs> and Chris has presented um, updated an updated vacancy notice for the board to review. Um, the suggestion is to put the vacancy out as soon as possible. I'm pretty sure that Tim wanted to he wanted that to happen once he found out that um, Chris was leaving. Um, I discussed the job description with Chris and with Tim, and they have both indicated, you know, there were some things that could change, but frankly, to get the vacancy up and running um, using the existing job description is probably the best way to do that. Um, so I did write a motion for everybody to immediately post the vacancy notice for the assistant town administrator's position. I got that one. Yeah, take it. Yeah. Move to immediately post the vacancy notice for the assistant town administrator position and use the current job description. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Now it's final. <laughs> Chris, aye. good luck. Thank you very much. And again, yeah, I'll, I won't be a stranger. You're not that far away. Nope, I will be right over the river in Montague. So yeah, again, thank you all. And I, I look forward to continuing my professional relationship with everyone. So now what do we do? So now, Crystal, we've talked about this. Um, Chris is going to throw it up on some of the, the key places we need it. Um, we'll send it out. He'll send it out through STAM, which is the Small Town Administrators Group. Um, we're going to put it up on the Mass Municipal Association website because that gets the most traffic for municipal positions, especially since this is sort of it's a key position because it assists the town administrator, but it also is key assisting with the select board as well. And I think that's probably our best driver. We're gonna put it up on the website. We'll put it up on the bulletin board out here in the front. And I think, Chris, you were gonna put it up on, were you gonna put it up on Indeed as well? I was. So if, if Chris thinks we need to put it up somewhere, or if I think of something, we'll coordinate that, but we'll get it up tomorrow okay so it's ready great um so now in the, the latter part of this um we have some some general appointments just for the police department yes. tonight right um you probably know most of these people blake mm -hmm. and uh do we do we need to read through all of them so normally trevor does but i've it, the appointments list is pretty strong, it, I mean long, and yep. Chris included this in the packet. So it's available for people if they would like to read through it. But frankly, I think you could consider making a motion that reflects basically the information provided in the memo dated June 3rd, 2024. Are you comfortable with that, Blake? Yes. Okay. So I wrote you a shorter motion than one that really included reading it into the record. Good. 
Move to approve the police department appointments sent in a memo dated June 3rd, 2024 by Chief Pachuric as presented. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Excellent. All right, so I will let John know. Um, you can expect motion, you can expect, um, sorry, I was looking at the word motion. Um, you can expect SCEMS to come before you next, on the next agenda. Um, I asked, I don't know if Blake heard me, but I asked Josh to make a couple of adjustments in how he presented the appointments list that he has. So he's gonna do that and we'll get it to you as soon as we get it. Um, I'll make sure it's on the next agenda. And then I did provide the board members with an updated list, and Pat's been updating this, of annual appointments for you to review. As we can continue to get appointment applications for, pe for people, we'll let you know. Um, and we're, we've compiled many of them into documents that are electronically available. I know Chris earlier this week sent out several. I sent out one, we received several more. So what may be worthwhile for us to do is wait until next Friday to compile another set of documents for you all to look at. Because thanks to Chris, we have an application for everybody to use and people are using it and sending things in. I received two today. So it's a lot to compile. Um, and since I'm receiving so many, I think I wanna give us a little bit of time to capture as much information as we can. Okay, yeah, no, that's great. And um, if you feel that the board would benefit from asking individual applicants if they could provide any additional information, I don't know that that's standard or. Um, it isn't normally standard, but we don't usually get as uh, quite the flurry of applications. There are several mm -hmm. applications for both alternate and um, regular ZBA. Okay. membership um, I think maybe between now and the next meeting if the board wanted and we have sent you several ZBA ones mm -hmm. if the board wanted to consider some sort of a, a short conversation with applicants that is something that could happen. The board's done it before, yep. particularly with the planning board a few years ago when we had several applicants for to fill a planning board spot for a certain period of time, Blake. There was a point where we had a couple resignations and we had to fill spots. So until that next election, the board received several requests for appointment and then conducted what amounts to a short interview discussion process um, with those interested candidates. So if the board wanted to do that, maybe you guys could think about that between now and um, the 20. Fourth, and we could put it on the agenda so that there's some framework for that. Okay, so we just notify you if we want to do that. If you want okay. to do that, notify me. Individually, yep, okay. Um, individually, and then you'll see if we receive any other applications for other positions or for other appointments, we'll include those for you. It's probably gonna be a lot of paper, so I just want to warn you. Yep. <laughs> um, we don't have any, do we have any permits in review? For, for we do not okay. that I'm aware of. And, and I don't think we have any updates on town campus buildings. No. Um, you guys conducted your process on Monday night to review the architect submissions. Right. And I know Chris Christopher isn't here, but I know Christopher's working on that. He and I talked about it earlier today because there's some information that's been requested from the the EDM stu the firm EDM mm -hmm. Studio. So he's working through that. I'm trying to help him with it. Um, but I got to think about it for a few minutes sometimes when he asks me mm -hmm. something. Um, so we're, so down, we're about down to mail. We're, we're about down to mail and the administration report. So there are a few things in the mail that you might want to take a look at. Yep. Um, One of them is the signage notification we received from DOT. I have not sent that to Kevin, but maybe it's worthwhile to send it to him because they basically are notifying us that we have a few signs that are deteriorating that we should replace. Mm -hmm. So that's the 
on the mail list, that's the that's the third or fourth item. I believe so. South Deerfield Village Center tourist oriented directional sign replacement. Yep. Okay. So your 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 thought is to Let's send it to Kevin and see if he can start setting up a process to replace it. They, the dimensional signs have specific requirements. Mm -hmm. My thought in sending it to Kevin is to figure out who the vendor is he would use to do this because we know Kevin's going to be gone soon. Right. Um, so that was my thought. And I unfortunately, DOT I didn't has have the a vendor. Pardon? I think DOT has the vendor because they're the ones that re put they the may, restrictions yeah, on they the may do that. size I just of the sign and the rest of it. So, yeah. So if he can give me some pointers on the contact information, that would be helpful so that we can alleviate some stress in that sense because I don't know what they're going to say. Or I don't know exactly right. how to order it either. Um, so um, before we, we we've, we've had uh, some conversation with the horse complaints earlier, but uh, and we'll acknowledge these yes. letters, but what about the um, fire consumer confidence report? That's a that's a routine report, um, similar to other types of report we get reports we get. Mm -hmm. It has to be filed a certain way, so they give us a copy of it. And so this is basically notifying us that we Infor received yeah, it. Yeah, it's information. And information. you take the necessary action if there is any. I can't. Yeah. So we will need to consider this and then ask you to do something. You could. All right. You could do that tonight. I think it's a mail item. I think if you want to consider doing something, maybe we throw it on and you. I, I don't. You know me. I tend to try to keep things clear cut so people yep. can see. The other thing is, is you could have um, Kevin and I confer about it because right. if there is an action. Um, there are times that Kevin does execute some of the responses to these yep. because it's, it's within sort of the parameters of, or the four corners of what we expect him to do as a superintendent. Mm -hmm. If he confers with me and I, I could then take that action if it's necessary. Yeah. Well, why don't, um, why don't you, I mean, if Blake agrees, why don't you and, and he confer and then bring any recommendation if, to if us? If we need to do something, yeah. we can bring right. it back to you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Let me write myself a note. So, um, so these are all the, the readings that they took from the water itself to, you yep. know, to make sure that it was. Yep. Okay. And uh, this was done by Stanley Yaswinski. I guess this is the the Deerfield Fire District, which is largely around Old Deerfield. Right, but their their wells are out on Stillwater, up yep. in that area there. Mm -hmm. And and we also, I think we received an. A letter in the mail. I, I'm in this district, so I think we received a letter in the mail already about the findings, which when I read it, it seemed okay. to a layman okay, but always better to let Kevin oh, yeah. Scarborough weigh in on it. Yep. <clears throat> and then we have, um, we heard from Mr. Johnson, and we, did. um, we didn't hear from Mr. Mono, but we have a letter from him about the horse, and then I guess Matthew spoke at the end, um, Matthew yeah. Troxel. Yes. Um, well, they're, they're the two that are affected. Where exactly, where, where Mr. Mono is a little further afield. It's across the road. <clears throat> it's across the road. So, and as we told them, we're gonna, we're gonna share this information and their, their wishes with the lawyer, um, Casey Will, and, and then yep. I have a note to do advise that us. What, if anything, we can do short of, I mean, obviously, they're right. If you're going to do anything that involves disinterment, you want to do that as quickly as possible. You have to, because especially when it starts to heat up, it's going to get worse. But I, now that I understand their concerns better, it's, you know, DEP doesn't want to give us a written letter, um, which leads me to believe that, you know, well, I don't know. I won't say anything. They, they just don't want to tell us. Right. They told us, you know, in words that they don't think we should dig it up, but uh, you know, um, we'll let our lawyer tell us what we right. should do because there are legitimate concerns, especially with young children next door. The water in that area is so so uh, persistent and so so high. Yes. Um, all right. Um, 
What's the next thing? Oh, what, can you talk about this liability? Which one is that? It's the, the summary of liability under Chapter 21E. So May June 6th letter. Yeah. Or is that just a note? I think it's this. I think it's somewhere. Right here. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I was in the middle of writing something. I don't have a full copy of it all. Um, okay. Does this go with the? Does this go with the DEP letter? Yeah, I said that's what I'm thinking. Is it yeah. goes with the DEP letter? So they send us these letters um, as notification that something's happened. Mm -hmm. So the, in this case, it was a um, diesel fuel release. Oh right, the, um, yeah. Yeah. they let us ten. know. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And so this is a tw the twenty one e. I recognize that reference. The twenty one e usually means you have to do some remediation to the site. Um, and this happened on 5 and 10, actually. Right. So they're notifying us. Yep. We're always the CC on these. We see, we see quite a few of them. Um, mm -hmm. We've had releases in various areas of town. Mm -hmm. um, and this being uh, on a state highway, is that they're taking care of it? They have to. So DEP notifies the person that was alleged to have caused the release. And mm -hmm. then they notify us. And then they'll, as, as things progress, we will get additional notifications, particularly if there's issues mm -hmm. with um, how the release is handled. It's okay. very prescribed. So 21Es are very prescribed. My reference background in terms of 21Es is how we had to deal with the old highway garage. It required the excavation, removal of any contaminated material, disposal of that material. Um, and it usually requires an engineer to, in our case, it required an engineer to sort of shepherd us through the, pro through the process. But DEP will keep us up to date if there's issues with that, fix, fixing, uh, in air quotes, that release. Mm -hmm. All right, and then there's this telecommunications letter. Um, no. That is the telecommunications letter related to Comcast, correct? Mm -hmm. So. Trevor and I talked about this because I, and I was waiting to talk to him because I remembered when I first came back in 2020, he sort of gave me some background on the Comcast renewal that had happened after I left in 2016. So we're up against the Comcast renewal again. And when he and I talked about it the other day, um, we're both going to do a little bit of background checking because I've never actually done a Comcast renewal. Mm -hmm. The previous town administrators had handled it because they're usually 10 year agreements. Ours is up December of 2026, but there's a renewal negotiation period and there's two different paths you can take. You can take the formalized process with, which takes quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, or you can take a streamlined process, which is direct negotiation with Comcast itself. Generally, this is done using what is called the Cable Advisory Committee. Um, so the first, when I saw that, the first question I had was, do we have an active Cable Advisory Committee? And it seems like we may not, because again, this comes up every 10 years. People mm -hmm. may not be aware of it. Um, so I think in light of the fact that we need to do a little bit of research on that, it may be useful if we consider doing the streamlined approach, but Trevor's question to me was, what's that entail, and is there any other way we can broaden you know, what's offered? And we don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think once you have a cable provider, there's really, really very little maneuverability there. You can't go know, with another provider? Right, because for some, and I don't remember all the details, so this is what I said to him. I said, look, let me do a little bit of research, and then I'll come back with more information. But mm -hmm. frankly, it's probably useful if we figure out about the Cable Advisory Committee and then research the process a bit more, which is what I would like to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, you know, we definitely need to know more. We need more. to get on it, but yeah. we need some more information before you guys can make a better decision, because it's mm -hmm. going to be your decision how you, how you move mm -hmm. forward. Well, I, the other thing I'd like to find out about this is that 
you know, you, you do have advertisements out there, of other cable companies saying yes. that they can come into town. So what we're finding out is they can't come into town? Well, that's what I want to know, and that's what Trevor so, and I both And I, th I think there might sure be people about. in town that have some background in there that we could put on a, maybe an ad hoc committee. To, well, um, yeah, well, there is a cable about. advisory committee, and if it's not active, you can appoint to it, I right. would think. Right. Um, if there are people interested, have them send an application in because this is one of those things that we really could use some expertise on. Now, mm -hmm. I do have a friend that used to do this professionally. Um, he worked in a cable access television group. So he has some background, but he and I haven't, we're playing phone tag right now. So I wanted to ask him some of these questions too because anecdotally, he's gonna have some information I may not be aware of. Right. And it, you know, I don't know if Lisa has any knowledge about this either. I, I, she may, and if yeah. I get a chance, I'll ask her. Okay. Because that, that's also one of the avenues I thought So about. We'll, we'll revisit but this. For, yeah, we're gonna have to revisit it. Okay. And um, I think that's all, and then and we're to, to your report. So I, my first question, I have a few things I want to give you guys in terms of background. Um, there's a couple of things that have been hanging around that I know people are concerned about. One of them is the landfill solar project. So Nexamp has been a little slow to turn around requests for information from our consultant, Beth Greenblatt. Our consultant helped, just for background, Blake, our consultant is part of the Beacon um, Integrated Solutions, I think. She specializes in solar in Massachusetts, and she helped our town council and the towns and the select board complete a request for proposal process to obtain a company to put solar on the landfill um, years ago. This has been years in process. Mm -hmm. Things like COVID and contract negotiations really took a toll on, on timing. So then we had, they had a slow, a slow down, the company that, awarded, that was awarded the contract, Nexamp, they had a slow down in the interconnection study and then the actual uh, contract process for that. So that took a long, long time. We, we recently received inf information from them that Beth could then evaluate through the lens of what's allowed and what's not allowed based on not only our RFP process, but where the interconnection study indicates Nexamp should fall within, there, there's a whole structure, they call them tranches. There's a whole structure that they would fall within, within based on the study itself. So she finally received some information and she and I had a meeting with them this week and they provided, they sort of asked us some questions and provided a back and forth and basically what I told them I would do, and this was after some discussion, I told them that I would forward the information that they were gonna respond to Beth with and then set a meeting up with council because we need Beth and council to sort of outline a path that then you guys can talk about in executive session because it has to do with contract negotiations. Not only for the pilot agreement, but for the lease agreement for the land itself. They both, both those things are connected. They balance each other out. So if one's low, the other one's higher and vice versa. So there's more information you're gonna need and you're gonna need a little more background from Beth. So I'm happy to, to be the conduit for that. Um, so that was the first thing. I know that, that there's going to be a change with the half marathon route based on some communication from Adam because the dry bridge is closed. So he's working on that. And I think he sent me an email today, but I haven't read it. Um, yeah, I think he, he suggested an alternate they said, path. Yeah, I think he suggested an alternate route. And I know he's in um, communication with Allison. Masley over at Treehouse, so that's going on. I will let you know that we, and I think I sent some emails, but we received at least two complaints about concerts at Treehouse, so we're gonna have to address that. And Allison's aware of them, I shared them with her. 
I have not had a chance to meet with Allison yet, but I'm thinking that might be a good idea because the complaints, really they're noise complaints. The noise carries in weird, weird ways in the valley, we know that. So I want to hear what she has to say, but there may be recommendations to at least get decibel measurements. I don't think we actually have that equipment. It's fairly expensive equipment. The last time we were measuring decibels for anything remotely like this, it was probably 10 or 15 years ago, and I think we borrowed the equipment if what Dick reminded me is true. So to the extent that we can measure noise, it's not an easy thing to do, and we don't have the equipment that I'm aware of. So that may be in the offing for you guys, but I did want to you know, publicly note for people that we had received some, co some complaints. And I think that these might be complaints from people who didn't claim, they've changed the direction slightly. They have. And trying to direct it more towards the highway, and, and so maybe in changing it, they, they created a, a problem that wasn't there before. But they you're right, we have to actually know you know, if, if the decibels are above what they're allowed to do, um, both on the site and if, if they're, you know, distances away. Um, I know my next door neighbor plays rock and roll music. You know, he's a young guy, 14 or so, it's really good. Um, and I hear it, but you know, it's, it's, not, as, it's not the same as a, as a public concert, so. Right. With, with speakers that go to the, yeah. almost to the roof. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a different thing. They have made some changes to how the stage was arranged. That was the reason that I made sure that Allison knew about the complaints. Um, I am very sure that at least one, probably both of the people that I recall their names right now, um, will, will probably want to talk about this, so I thought I should get ahead of it, at least by bringing it up with you and letting you know that I've tr I'm trying to do at least a little bit of background so that you guys have a place and to start. Keep in mind not only the, the sound of it, but the, when you have a deep bass like that, the vibration of it too. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot of times people misinterpret the sound for the fact that things are just vibrating because of those speakers are just throwing out sound waves that are vibrating, th can vibrate for miles. Yeah, know. different hertz levels create yep. different kinds of problems for people. Some don't like the high notes and right. other people don't like the bass notes, as you said. You guys know more than I do. That's a good thing. Um, I cannot be an expert at many things. Um, all right, so. But thank we you for did notifying us. Yeah. I just wanted you to know. No, I mean, I know I send you guys a lot of emails, but there are times I think people think I don't tell you things, and that's mm. not the case. No, I'm I sending a bunch of emails out. Complaint. <laughs> yeah, I, I know people don't want to see emails from me, but. It's usually because I want you to be aware of something. So we also have a recommendation from the building commissioner on the permit fees. This was saved in our mat meeting materials files, but I forgot to ask you if we could include it. So mm -hmm. I talked to um, Amy this afternoon, and we're going to put it on for the 26th. Okay. So he, he wrote a memo up. Um, there's a couple of other things that are just hanging around the police HVAC system. I know if you're driving around that's the office, you've seen the trucks. They're putting that system in. It's, it should be done by the end of the month. Um, and there's various things going on. They need connections to different things. So we're just trying to work with them, make sure that happens. The Stillwater Bridge repairs, we ha still have some work to do on the Article 97. And I think one of the things that I received was follow-up requests from Open Space and Rec. And the reason they tie in is Article 97 is something we're going to have to deal with in terms of the bridge repairs, but also the goals that Open Space wants to achieve by putting more land in conservation. And there's a parcel that's nearby, that's near Still Stillwater, that might be useful. So I've asked Council to give me some assistance and then thereby give the open space committee some assistance on this. So that's out there for her to deal with as well. Okay. Um, how, so after we met, I've been thinking, after we met yesterday, um, and I had a conversation this morning with our soon to be retired public works superintendent, 
How does the board want to proceed? Do you want to have a separate meeting and really hammer out a process to move ahead with evaluating divisions the divisions and yet we still need staff to run things like we need an operational plan here do you guys want to sit down and have a separate meeting to do that when trevor's around we were also we're talk talk talking about the dpw right yeah. we we're also talking about interviewing chris too. right so, right i mean i i didn't i didn't use the same question so it would still be useful i didn't meet with them personally over at the dpw and walked around and just acquainted myself with stuff but my concern is one is that you know we've talked to Mr. Bergeron. That was a good interview. Um, he needs to know something by a certain date, but we can't have a process bet between now and then. So it's going to be difficult. We're going to have to find an, if that's a route we want to pursue. We're going to have to lean on Casey to tell us how we do that. Um, and you know, right? Because. With with Chris Miller, if we wanted him to be the he's he's acted as the interim chief on a number of occasions for health emergencies and for you know um, other reasons, and he's already employee. So we could do something like we did with um, South County EMS, where an internal person became the interim chief for a period of time while we went through a process. I'm not sure, and I want to get some legal advice about and Casey's advice about how we do that if we go outside and we haven't gone through a process because I don't feel comfortable and I know you probably don't either no um, so we need to sort this out so I was thinking if we wanted to have a special meeting um, you guys I can text Trevor and see if he could do a meeting or email him tomorrow yeah. Um, but if you wanted to have a meeting just to focus on that topic, I can tell you what we've done in the past. Um, in terms of continuity of service, it might be most expeditious to, because we've done this in the past when we've had departments where we needed to have that continuity, so we created a pathway where there was a temporary pay adjustment to allow for a person um, to take on some of those duties and, and receive appropriate compensation to take that on. Um, it may be that it would be useful for us to hire a temporary laborer to add to the team since we're already down a person. Yep. Um, there's, there's, I've had conversations with other staff people about sort of the administrative pieces versus the operational pieces. I think if we could come to some sort of consensus relatively soon, it would be easier. And I think everybody would feel a little more secure. But I do think there's going to have to be, and so Blake has not experienced this, but there was a period of time where we had a severe staffing sor shortage in the financial department. And what we had to do was make adjustments with other departments to spread some of that stuff out so that we so the critical I'm, work I'm very done. aware of how that works. Yeah, I bet you are. We did it, but we did it sort of on a much smaller scale, scale than I think you might have experienced. You've had a bigger job than me. So we did the best we could, and we tried to mitigate circumstances. It may be that we're in a similar situation. Okay. I mean, I, I think it would be useful to have a, you know, a 4 o'clock meeting. And, and, okay. You know, but Trevor's... Um, with Stevie Nicks tonight, so I don't really want to bother him. <laughs> but um, but so, tomorrow. Okay, okay we'll let that so go. So we have to post for it. The earliest we could post is Monday afternoon. Yeah, because we've got the holiday. Um, personnel board has a meeting at 6 o'clock, too. So I have to go to personnel because that's one of my assignments. Um, yeah. So the earliest we could do is Monday. Do you want to try to do it Monday can, or Tuesday? Can we shift it for Tuesday? Yeah, if you want to. Because I'll be in Boston. Okay. Yeah. I just don't know what time I'm going to be back. Yeah, yeah, no. Take care All of right. that. Um, I will see if we can do Tuesday at 4. Yeah. Do you want to yep. do in person? Yeah, I think okay. that would be best. I'm assuming Trevor can. I will check with him. If he can't, then I'll see what we can do. 
Sorry to interrupt. I don't know if this changes anybody's mind, but the finance committee is meeting at four o'clock on Tuesday. Oh, that's right. It's the 18th. Uh, theirs is remote, but I don't know if anybody was interested in going to that. Uh, if not, then they could both happen simultaneously. I just wanted to make sure people were aware. Usually I go. Um... I mean, I'm, I'm available at three. I don't know about Trevor. I don't know about what Blake. What do you want to do? Um, I can see if Trevor's available. I'll make sure I'm available. Three o'clock? Yeah. All right. I'll do it at three. Yep. Okay, thanks. And I will talk to him about whether he can be here. Um, that's most of what I have. There was a couple of other little details, but most of it you've seen in emails. So. Okay. Well, it's pretty comprehensive. Oh, I had one question for you. In terms of the agenda next for the 26th, are you going to put ARPA on there? Um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Okay. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's. It's. Uh, I got to see what Brenda says. She says she's going to have the information I need, but. Okay. Um, so Blake had asked if we could add something to the agenda, yeah. and I had sent the information out. It was a questionnaire to the chairs and committees. Yep. Um, so I, I just want to if if. That so, can go on the agenda as well. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, did I forget anything, Blake? You had asked me a couple of things. No, I took some of them off. Yeah. Um, we'll look at them a little bit further down the road. And I, I do have a couple that I may want to talk to you about yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, to see if we can put them on. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I think we're still working on some public records requests, and, and one of them is related to uh, 85 North Main Street. And it's really... It pertains to the environmental study they're doing on that property. Mm -hmm. Senior, it's a senior housing thing. Mm -hmm. um, we can't find those records, so I'm going to reply back and let them know. I've already done my best to answer their survey questions, so they're going to continue to finish this environmental piece of it because mm -hmm. I guess it's part of developing the RFP. Right. And I have not heard from Lily about the RFP, but she'll let me know if she needs anything from okay. me. Right. You do have two requests. You have land, and they're actually land related. I sent an email about one of them, but I wanted to outline really quickly the other one. So we, there, I mentioned the parcel that open space committee's interested in. Right. And I have some of that information. I will send it out to you. But there's also a, there's a request for consideration to sell a piece of property along Conway Road. It's map 149, lot 18.1. Um, there's some background on that property that involves Board of Health, so I'm gonna speak to the Board of Health agent. I did send an email about it, but I wanna speak to him. Hopefully he'll be in tomorrow, I can talk to him about it. And then I was advised this afternoon that someone, a potential buyer, for a property along Pocumtuck Drive is interested in having the town build out the road beyond the cul-de-sac. And I can give you a piece of paper. I was trying to make a copy and then I had to fix something before the meeting, so I didn't have it printed. But the parcel, the town owns the parcel beyond the cul-de-sac. So at the end of Pocumtuck Drive, there's a cul-de-sac and it sort of stops, but there's property beyond there that the town owns. And at some point in time, I think the intent was to extend the road, but there seems to be some resistance, or may have been some resistance to that, because the road and uh, Pocomtuck Drive ends in a cul-de-sac. You can see on a topo on the one of the maps in the system, the GIS system, you can see that there's a basically a trail that goes all the way down to River Road. So. Somebody who's interested in buying a piece of property beyond the cul-de-sac wants the town to build the road. And I wanted you to be aware of it because it was brought to my attention. Frankly, it's a pretty complicated thing. It would yeah. cost lots of money. And that area is not maintained. So and I wanted to give you just... How would it affect the neighbors up there? It, it would be a significant process because the okay. neighborhood would probably... You know, I, I know that that area is interested in maintaining its quiet solitude. I've had 
I've actually had residents out there tell me that. Um, but well, you should know it's out there. Yeah, and I, I also think that there's some conservation commission questions about. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's I've had be discussions about that. So it's, I know that Pete Law lives out there, so he might be a resource about understanding the impact, the the the, the types of land that's out there. Um, yeah. Plus, it's an expensive endeavor that we well, yeah, I mean, uh, have to fund. Um, and I'm not sure that's in with, within our ability to pay for at this point. Yeah. Um, Just based um, on the last budget season. I'd certainly want to hear from somebody that knows the law whether somebody can just say, hey, I want you to build a road so I can build a house somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that seems a little extreme to me. <laughs> that thought did cross my mind. So, <clears throat> so that's for well, informational purposes. The other part of it I'm is done. you're saying that you think we have a parcel of land up there. Do we I know we actual? own it. I did look it up. We do own the parcel beyond the cul-de-sac, but okay. it stops, and I can show you what that looks like. Ke I printed okay. it. Kevin showed me how to find it. But for informational purposes, at least you know that the question's out there. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think we would have to get some advice from legal counsel about it. That's all I have. All right. Chris, what do you have? I got nothing. All right. <laughs> um, well, in that case, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchie, aye. All right, thank, thank you. you.